This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Once again, it's time to call on our old friend, that incomparable host and storyteller, Dr. Watson. He's waiting for us in his familiar study. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. I won't get up, if you don't mind. This change in the weather has given me a twinge or two of rheumatism, I'm afraid. No, I'm sorry to hear that, Dr. Watson. Well, we old fossils can't expect to be as hale and hearty as you young fellows, you know. I don't know that I feel so young today, Dr. Watson. I stopped by the military academy this afternoon and saw my cousin there. He's 13 years old, and after an hour with him, I realized I'm really quite ancient. 13 years old. Oh, a fine age. He's happy at the school, Mr. Bell? Crazy about it. Yes, I'm sure that in this day and age, a boy almost looks forward to going to school... Conditions were far different in certain parts of England just before the turn of the century, I'm afraid. I'm thinking in particular of a school that Holmes and I had occasion to visit and of the frightened, unhappy youngsters who lived there in mortal terror of their lives. Oh, this has all the hallmarks of the beginning of a Sherlock Holmes adventure. It is, my boy. It's a story I call The Singular Affair of the Dying Schoolboys. But before I begin, haven't you a message for our listeners? Yes, I have. Folks, it looks as if we're in for plenty of excitement tonight with Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. And men, I'll bet you'll be plenty excited about the great improvement in the appearance of your hair once you use Kremel hair tonic. Frankly, I've tried any number of hair dressings, but it took Kremel to really convince me that my hair can always be neat without having to plaster it down with grease or those sticky, gooey concoctions. And Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking attractive. It makes hair so much easier to comb and actually helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer, easier to manage. At the same time, Kreml removes embarrassing dandruff flakes. It relieves itching due to dry scalp and leaves your scalp feeling so clean, so alive. Man, what a treat. Now be sure to buy a bottle at any drug counter spelled K R E M L. Kremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the singular affair of the dying schoolboys? Well, Mr. Bell, that strange adventure began on a stormy September evening in Baker Street many, many years ago. All day long, the wind had screamed and the rain had beaten against our windows. Shortly after dinner, there was the old familiar jangle on our front doorbell. And a few moments later, Mrs. Hudson ushered a distinguished visitor into the room. As he stood there in front of the flickering firelight, I could see that he was a good-looking man and also that he was in a state of considerable excitement. Now, Lord Manders, if you will just give us the facts. Well, Mr. Holmes, three years ago, I was a passenger on that ill-fitted ship, the the Sophie Anderson. She was wrecked in a gale and I was the only survivor. I clung to a piece of broken spar and was washed ashore. And after that, for over two years, I lived alone on an island in the Indian Ocean. Naturally, when the Sophie Anderson foundered, I was believed to be dead. My young brother, Eric, who was next in line, inherited the estate and the guardianship of our uncle. There must have been quite a lot of confusion when you arrived home this year, Lord Manders. There was, Dr. Watson, but not for the reason you suppose. I landed in England to find that my brother had died last December. Oh, indeed, I'm very sorry. He died under very peculiar circumstances. That's why I've come to you, Mr. Holmes. What were those circumstances? My uncle sent Eric to a school on the Welsh Moors, not far from Cardiff. A school known as Punsonby Hall. He died in a school infirmary there, supposedly of pneumonia. And you have some reason to believe it was not pneumonia? Nothing definite. I've been down to the school, but Dr. Punson, to the owner, was too ill to see me. However, I did talk to a frightening woman there, who's the matron of the place, a Mrs. Arkwright. I became suspicious. So I stayed on and, for a few days, made some local inquiries. With what results? Punsonby Hall has a black name with the villagers, Mr. Holmes. Five boys have died there in the last two years under circumstances similar to my brother's. Good gracious me. I presume that you immediately had an accounting with your uncle? My uncle had settled another account before my return, Mr. Holmes. He died of a heart attack last February. But I am certain he was responsible for Eric's death. You see, he stood to inherit the estate. It may sound incredible, 
But I believe Eric was murdered at Punsonby Hall. Murdered in a boys' school? Oh, come, 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 sir. Such things can't happen in this 19th century of ours. But they can, Watson. And do, unfortunately. You don't mean it. I do. A private school situated in a desolate spot and operated by an unprincipled scoundrel could provide excellent and profitable opportunities for removing unwanted relatives. What a ghastly thought. Mr. Holmes, I know that Eric's dead and nothing can bring him to life again. But I can try and avenge his death and bring his murderer to justice. You will help me, won't you? Yes, Lord Manders, I will. If these shocking occurrences have been taking place, we may be able at least to prevent further tragedies. Watson, suppose we join Lord Manders on the West of England Express tonight and tomorrow see what can be done to penetrate the black clouds that surround Punsonby Hall. We're walking in the wrong direction, Mr. Holmes. The school's behind us. And before going there, I thought we might profitably pay a visit here in the village to Llewellyn Coffin. Oh, who's he? The local undertaker. An undertaker named Coffin? <laughs> That's very funny, isn't it? Coffin, undertaker. <laughs> Quite. Funny. But try and control your amusement, will you, Watson? Oh, sorry, Oliver. Here's his establishment now. Good day, gentlemen. Mr. Coffin? Yes, sir. That's my name, Coffin. We're strangers in these parts, and we're in search of information. I'm hoping, Mr. Coffin, that you'll be able to help us. What I can do, sir, I will, and do it gladly. I understand that you've had an unusually large proportion of business from Punsonby Hall in the past two years. Five boys died, didn't they? Five boys it was. Mr. Coffin, we've heard some strange stories in the village. Yes, stories that make us wonder if those deaths were from natural causes. Gentlemen, I'm a simple man, look you. A man who plies his trade but cannot afford to ask questions... What goes on at Punsonby Hall, and I'll not say strange things haven't happened there, is none of my business. Then let me appeal to your sympathies. My young brother died at Punsonby Hall last December. You must have buried him. Your brother? Well, now look you, that makes it different. But you'll not say anything up at the hall, sir. Dr. Punsonby's a savage man. Don't worry on that score, Mr. Coffin. What do you have to know him, sir? All the five boys were supposed to have had pneumonia, I understand. That's what the medical report said. Who signed those reports? Dr. Punsonby himself. He's a regular medical doctor, look you. How very convenient. No questions had to be asked. Mr. Coffin, when you prepared those bodies for burial, did you notice anything unusual about them? Anything to make you think their deaths were possibly not caused by pneumonia? No, sir. Think now. Think, uh... uh well... Now that you mention it, there was one thing I was after noticing. Oh, what was that, my good man? The boys had a strange look on their faces as they lay there, as if something had frightened the wits out of them just before they died. That's very odd. The face of anyone dying from pneumonia would be in repose. Did you notice anything else, Mr. Coffin? Any other peculiarity? Well, there was one thing, sir, that gave me to thinking. All the boys had marks on them. Mm, stretch marks they were on their necks or shoulders. Perhaps they were bites. Remember Dr. Rylett of Stoke Moran, Holmes? Uh, did these marks look like the bites of a snake, Mr. Coffin? No, that they weren't. Look, you, I know a snake bite when I see one. Didn't these marks make you suspicious? That they did, sir. And when I saw them on the boys, I took my courage in my hands and asked Dr. Ponsonby. And what did he say? Inoculation marks. He said that he had tried to save them with some newfangled medicine. No autopsy was held on the boys? No, sir. Dr. Ponsonby is the only doctor in these parts, look, you... He gave the certificates. Who was to ask any questions? Exactly. Come on, Watson, Lord Manders. This has been a very promising start. Thank you, Mr. Coffin. You've been most helpful. It was a pleasure to talk to you, gentlemen. But please don't be after repeating what I said. Well, Mr. Holmes, I think you'll agree my suspicions were well grounded. Yes. And we'll lose no time investigating this matter. I think we may work faster if we divide our forces. I shall return to the inn and compose a telegram that I shall ask you to send for me, Lord Manders. Of course, Mr. Holmes. Aren't you going to punch in the hall, Holmes? Not immediately. However, you, my dear Watson, can be my advance guard. Me? Yes. I think that your open countenance, combined with that delightful Scottish accent you sometimes assume, plus an appropriate name, should lull Dr. Punsonby into believing that he has another wealthy customer who needs his very specialized services. Well, Holmes, I'll, uh, I'll do my best. Just the same, I'll be very relieved when you get on the scene.
I'm Mrs. Arkwright, the school matron. Whom did you wish to see? I want to have a word with Dr. Funsonby. My name is Angus McLaughlin, and I'm most anxious to send my young cousin here. Oh? Aye, he needs discipline. And I'm told that you didn't pamper a young lad here. Please come in. I'm sure Dr. Funsonby will see you. Thank you, Mrs. Arkwright. Come in. Go in, please. Dr. Punsonby? Yes, uh, please sit down, won't you? Uh, thank you, sir. My name is Angus McLaughlin. I've travelled all the way from Aberdeen to see you. I was told that at your school you at least know how to uh, discipline a lad. Well, Mr. McLaughlin, <laughs> in our modest way, we endeavour to inculcate our students with a sense of responsibility. Aye, aye, aye. I was about to have a glass of wine. Perhaps you'd care to join me? That's very kind of you, Dr. Bunsen. I'd like to. You uh, wish to send a relative here, Mr. McLaughlin? Aye, sir, uh, a young cousin of mine, if you'll, if you'll take him. And here's your wine, Mr. McLaughlin. Thank you, sir. And to your very good health. Ah, that's very good. <laughs> Tell me more about your cousin, sir. Before I accept a new student, I like to know as much about him as possible. Well, I'll be quite frank with you. He's 13 years old and he's a young devil, and an inconvenient young devil, too. You see, Dr. Funsonby, I'm his guardian. You, you follow me? No, sir, I don't think I do. <laughs> well, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I'm not a poor man. And I'd be a very wealthy one if, uh, if it weren't for that boy. The whippersnapper is the only person who stands between me and uh, my dead brother's fortune. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be sorry if, <laughs> if anything were to happen to him. Uh, am I making myself quite uh, clear, Doctor? Much clearer, Mr. McLaughlin. <laughs> Another glass of wine? Thank you. Well, it's, it's very good. Mr. McLaughlin, why not put all your cards on the table? So much simpler that way. Very well. Does 10,000 pounds mean anything to you, Dr. Punsonby? You dear me, yes. The scholastic profession is notoriously unremunerative. If my young cousin were to be taken ill, perhaps, shall we say, uh, with pneumonia, if he, uh, if he were to, to die here at your school... Uh, oh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. I'd pay you ten thousand pounds. And uh, now, sir, I, I can't be more explicit than that. No, no, no can I? I don't think so. <laughs> By the way, Mr. McLaughlin, your Scottish accent is beginning to disappear. Such a pity. It was quite colourful. This wine's drugged. You, you haven't touched your wine's drugged. I'm a most abstemious man. <laughs> Particularly on occasions like this. Dr. Watson? Dr. Watson, uh, how, how did you know my name? Even in this remote spot, I've seen photographs of you and your friend, the famous Sherlock Holmes. Uh, I'm just a little hurt that you both thought I was stupid enough to be fooled so easily. Oh, you seem dreadfully sleepy, Dr. Watson. Sleep, yes, I've got to go to sleep. And sleep well, my friend. <laughs> I only hope that you don't have too much trouble waking up. In just a moment, we'll find out just how much trouble Dr. Watson does have in waking up. But first, have you noticed how men are taking a greater interest in their appearance lately? Competition today is keener than ever. And I'm sure you'll agree one of the greatest assets to a man's appearance is well-groomed hair. So, men, let me give you this tip about Kremel hair tonic and why it's preferred by so many of America's most successful and prosperous executives. Kremel, K-R-E-M-L, keeps dry, ruffled hair neatly in place all day long. It gives it such a handsome, healthy-looking luster, too. Yet Kremel never leaves hair with that offensive, cheap, greasy look. It never leaves hair and scalp full of sticky goo, which feels so dirty. Kremel always looks and smells so clean on both hair and scalp. It gives hair that attractive, natural, he-man look, which certainly hits the jackpot with the ladies. And don't forget, Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Let me repeat, 
Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. It makes hair feel softer, easier to manage. At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes and makes the scalp feel so clean and invigorated. Men, use Kreml hair tonic daily. And see if you don't say, my hair never looked better. My scalp never felt cleaner. Well, Dr. Watson, you certainly left me teetering on the edge of my chair. We left you drugged in the schoolmaster's study. What happened next? Well, my first conscious recollection was to find myself with a violent pounding in my head, lying in a small clearing between some trees. Bending over me with a look of deep concern on his face was my old friend Sherlock Holmes. Watson. Uh-huh. Watson, old chap, uh, are you all right? Yes, yes, I, I got a frightful headache, Holmes. What are you doing there in those, those clothes with that droopy moustache? It proved a good enough passport to secure me employment at the stables here. Well, how did you get me out of Punsonby study? And the stables command an excellent view of the school building. Your long absence worried me. And when Dr. Punsonby finally appeared, alone, I became suspicious. So I took advantage of his absence, slipped through the study window and rescued you. Well, thank heavens you did. He gave me drugged wine. It's a funny thing, Holmes. I was probably delirious, but I swear that I saw a woman's handbag on the table. A pink and black beaded bag, and it was alive and moved. Great heavens! That confirms my worst suspicions. Did you see it too? No, it wasn't there when I came in. Somebody, probably Mrs. Arkwright, removed it. Watson, you were never closer to death. I blame myself for having allowed you to tackle Dr. Punsonby alone. Uh, don't reproach yourself, Holmes. Where, where is Lord Manders? Waiting at the inn for an answer to my telegram. He is to meet us later behind the lodge gates. What's our next move? To go to the stables, dirty you up a bit and get you a change of clothes. Then we'll return to the attack. There's desperate work ahead of us. Way, sir. What, my man? <laughs> Don't look so alarmed, Lord Manners. Dr. Watson, I, I wouldn't have recognized you. What's happened? Trouble. I had to assume a disguise, too. You brought an answer to Holmes's telegram? Yes, in my pocket. Where is he? He went over to the main school building and asked me to keep watch for you here at the, the gates. Oh, here he is now. Is there an answer to my telegram, Lord Manders? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Yeah, splendid. I was right. What is it, Holmes? I haven't time to explain now. At the moment, we have to work, and work fast, before Mr. Coffin has another client from Punsonby Hall. What have you discovered? Among other things, that the second cook, an acidulated woman of dubious charms, is most susceptible to flattery. Over a glass of stout, she quite inadvertently gave me three vital clues. What were they? Firstly, that all five of the unfortunate boys died in the same small room. Secondly, that that fatal room is directly under the room of Mrs. Arkwright. And she's capable of anything, if you ask me. The third clue makes our next step an urgent one. A boy by the name of Carruthers Minor was moved into that room yesterday. He's supposed to have an extremely bad cold. Dr. Punsonby is afraid it might turn into pneumonia. Good heavens! Exactly, Watson. I suggest we lose no time in visiting Carruthers Minor. Though I'm sure Dr. Punsonby would consider it unethical, this is one occasion when another doctor's opinion is absolutely vital. <laughs> There, there, Carruthers. This is Dr. Watson. He's come to make you well. You can't make me well. Dr. Punsonby says I've got pneumonia. Oh, nonsense, my dear boy. You've got a slight cold, that's all. If Dr. Punsonby says I've got pneumonia, pneumonia's what I've got. Nothing of the kind, my boy. Nothing of the kind. Watson, you notice this bed is anchored to the floor? It can't be moved. What does that suggest to you? Well, again, it reminds me of Stoke Moran and Dr. Rylett. But I don't see any bell pull. No, Watson. No bell rope is needed, because no murderous snake is involved in this plot. But look up there, directly above the bed. A small trap door. Leading from Mrs. Arkwright's room. Now the whole picture's clear. The trap door, the strange marks on the dead boys, the beaded bag that you saw. What, what was that? I don't know. Lord Manders is standing guard in the hallway. It's Dr. Ponsonby. He's come to look at my pneumonia. Mrs. Arkwright. I know you were expecting Lord Manders. He's lying in the hallway. He was looking in the wrong direction, unfortunately for him. Don't let Mrs. Arkwright come near me. Don't let her. 
Mrs. Arkwright, I'd put that revolver away if I were you. I doubt if you know how to handle it. I assure you that I do. Having used the butt end of it on your friend so successfully should prove that fact. Grab her, Watson. Get away from Drop me. Drop that revolver, Mrs. Arkwright. That's right. That's the old oh, it. Drop that revolver, do you hear me? Ah, that's better. I say, Holmes, she's fainted. Good. Help me carry her up to her room. Well, what about young Carruthers and Lord Manders? We must remove them to a place of safety. And then, Watson, all that remains is to call on the giggling Dr. Punsonby. <laughs> very dark in here, Holmes. I don't like this at all. Quiet. Somebody's coming. Good evening, Dr. Punsonby. Let me light your desk lamp for you. You startled me. Who are you? What are you doing in my study? My name is Sherlock Holmes. Dr. Watson, you've already met. Yes, we've met you, scoundrel. Oh, yes. Uh, My friend, the Scotsman. I was expecting you both. Uh, By the way, please put that revolver away. (laughs) Firearms make me nervous. Uh, Dr. Punsonby, I know how those five boys were murdered. I would venture the opinion that you once spent some time for the sake of your health in America. In Arizona Territory, I'd say. I wonder what makes you think that, Mr. Holmes. (laughs) I've never been in America in my life. And yet I'm certain that someone here spent some time in the vicinity of the Gila River. Well, I understand that uh, Mrs. Arkwright was in America a few years ago. Mrs. Arkwright? Dr. Punsonby, is it possible you're hoping to transfer our suspicions to your accomplice? My accomplice? You talk in riddles, Mr. Holmes. (laughs) It's most confusing. Then shall we be more specific? You consider Carruthers Minor to be quite ill, I understand. Oh, yes, I'm dreadfully worried about him. Well, then let me tell you, Dr. Punsonville, that I examined the boy only a few minutes ago, and as a medical man, I say that he only has a slight cold. Then obviously we disagree in our diagnosis, Dr. Watson. After all, you're just a general practitioner, whereas I specialize... Yes, we know what you specialize in. Gentlemen, I suggest the three of us go over to Carruthers' room and hold a consultation. It's just possible that his health has taken a sudden turn for the better. <laughs> But the bed's empty. Carruthers Minor has gone. Yes, Dr. Punsonby. And suppose you take his place. Leave me alone. What are you about to do? Lash you to this bed and see if you can stomach your own filthy medicine. This is outrageous. Of course. I thought that if we were to reconstruct your crimes with you as the victim, we might persuade you to confess. Mrs. Arkwright! Mrs. Arkwright, help! I'm afraid she can't help you. She's in her room with the door locked from the outside. Uh, There we are, Holmes. He's lashed up so that he can't move. But you don't understand. Mrs. Arkwright has been stuck. Great heavens! What was that? Mrs. Arkwright. It came from the room above. Come on, Watson. Quick, up the stairs. She's fainted again. Feel her pulse. I just go to... Holmes, there is no pulse. She's dead. The poison works fast. Observe those marks on her wrist. Looks as if some animal had bitten it. It has. And that means the animal's loose in this room. Great heavens. Somehow it must have escaped from its cage and turned on her. Guard the door, Watson. Our lives are not safe until we've found this monster. I don't understand. Look. Look. Under that washstand there. Good heavens, it's that, that beaded handbag again. And it's moving. Give me your walking stick, Watson. Here. There. This diabolical creature has done enough damage for one lifetime. It's dead, Holmes. But what in thunder is it? It looks like some sort of lizard. It's all pink and covered all over with black scales. That's what made me think it was a handbag. But I've never seen a lizard as large as that. Of course you haven't. So let me introduce you to the peculiar villain of this piece. His name is Heloderma Suspectum, better known as the Gila Monster, indigenous to the Gila River in America. I've never seen anything like that before. How on earth did you recognize it, Holmes? When Mr. Coffin, the undertaker, mentioned those strange marks on the dead boys, I was reminded of an article I'd read recently on venomous lizards. So that telegram you sent was to the... Was to the Museum of Natural History. Their answer confirmed my suspicions. The Gila Monster's bite produces almost instantaneous death, and yet it's a poison that would be extremely hard to identify. The fixed bed in the room below us, the trap door directly above it in this room, 
and the help of an unscrupulous accomplice like Mrs. Arkwright makes the rest of the picture very clear. Now that the monster's dead, how are you going to frighten Dr. Punsonby into a confession? Uh, Dr. Punsonby need not know the animal's dead. Examine the floor, Watson. See if you can find that trap door. Right, your home. Meanwhile, I'll see if I can find some cord or string. Uh-huh. Here's a ball of twine on the dressing table. Placed there for use in the intended murder of Carruthers Minor, no doubt. Uh, found the trap, Holmes. There's a ring here in the floor and a section of the carpet's been cut out. Good. And now to attach the twine to the body of the healer monster. So. All right, Watson. Open the trap door. Very well, Holmes. Well, Dr. Ponsonby, have you changed your mind? She's dead, Dr. Ponsonby. Your healer monster turned on her. No! No! I'm going to lower the animal, Watson. There we are. Oh, get away from me! Just a few more feet will do the trick, Holmes. Yes. There. Take it away! I say you anything! Everything! You'll sign a confession? Yes, Mr. Holmes, yes, I will! Just take that beast away and I'll sign anything! We'll be down, Dr. Ponsonby. Well, Holmes, thank heavens that's done with. What a shocking affair. Yes, Watson, but not without a note of poetic justice. What do you mean? Well, isn't it poetic justice that a dead reptile should be instrumental in bringing a live one to the gallows? Quite a gruesome finale, Dr. Watson. It certainly was, Mr. Bell. All in all, one of the most unpleasant adventures that Holmes and I ever encountered. In just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us about next week's story. Girls, how would you like a thrilling new experience? Then just listen to how beautiful Powers models glamour bathe their hair. We certainly were thrilled to discover the amazing, beautifying action of Cremel Shampoo. It actually glamour bathes each tiny strand of hair and leaves hair sparkling for days with natural glossy luster. And Cremel Shampoo is so mild and gentle, it positively contains no harsh caustics or chemicals. Instead, it has a beneficial oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Oh, and don't forget how its luxurious active foam penetrates right to the scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Girls, why not follow the advice of these million-dollar powers models and glamour bathe your hair with beautifying Kreml shampoo? It takes only ten minutes right at home. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, how about next week? Well, uh, let me see. Next week. Next week, I think I'll tell you the adventure of the genuine Garnelius in which Holmes solved the mystery of Drenko, the famous violinist, who was found dead in a locked room clutching a suicide note, but who nevertheless had been murdered. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Speckled Band. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the genuine Garnarius. This is ABC... The American Broadcasting Company. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.